week's episode, we welcome whiskey investment expert Mark Littler onto the podcast to talk about, wait for it, not drinking your whiskey. I know, I don't quite understand it either. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. And with the release of his whiskey bottle investment guide, he'll be giving us a crash course in the interesting and exciting world of bottle investment and collection. You can find some more whiskey content, images, videos, and all kinds of goodies on our social media platforms at Whiskey and Things Podcast on Instagram and at Whiskey and Things on Facebook and Twitter. And don't forget to give us a rating if you haven't done so already. Please do. It means a lot. You're listening to Whiskey and Things with Nick Kent and Dave Giles. Welcome to Whiskey and Things, the podcast. I'm Dave Giles. And I am Nick Kent. How are you, Dave Giles? Very rare of you to ask. I'm very well, thanks, Nick. How are you? I ask. I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I ask excellent. all the time. What's the matter Look, with you, Nick? Um, I just, I'm, I, I think we should just crack on today because we've just done the interview and it's fascinating. I just think we should just get into it because it's, yeah, it's bloody no, I, great. Yeah, we've it's done bloody the, great. We've done the pleasantries. We Let's have done. On. There yes. we go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yes. today's guest is Mark Littler, a whiskey investment specialist. He runs Mark Littler Limited. Uh, that's actually quite a mouthful. Anyway, who, who are uh, <laughs> independent consultants and whiskey brokers. And some of our listeners might have watched some of Mark's videos on YouTube where he talks about the history of interesting bottles. Yeah, he talks about a bit of investment on there as well. Um, some of you might know him also from other whiskey influencers, that word, influencers, uh, like uh, Vin PF of No Nonsense Whiskey, who uh, reviewed some exciting bottles of whiskey that Mark has been sharing around. He does these round robins where he opens a nice bottle of whiskey and he sends them around to people to try. They might I not think, be, think, you know. I think Jeff Whiskey's had some as well. Yeah, there's been a bunch of people. Uh, and um, New Jam Drinker, I think. New Jam Drinker too. Yeah, yeah. so you, you might have uh, heard of Mark Littler through that. Some of our other friends. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we're still waiting on ours. We we're, we're working it out <laughs> at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, Mark, Mark, this interview is pretty crazy, and uh, we both learned a lot. So let's uh, let's just crack on and roll the tape. Welcome, Mark Littler, to the Whiskey and Things podcast. How are Welcome. you today? Very good. Yes, good for good for the start of the week. Yeah, Monday. Oh, it is a Monday. Yes, yeah, I'm losing is. all track. Losing all track of time. <laughs> yes. Um, well, let's start by just give us a little bit of an idea of your whiskey origin story. That's how we like to start these shows. Um, what gave you the whiskey bug back in the beginning? I think it's sort of one of the drums that I would say like most people start on, and it was a Glenfiddich. You know, I think it was a Glenfiddich 12 that... Mm. Mm. me and my dad and, and I think before him I used to sort of see my granddad drinking and then it's still now one of the, one of my favorite drums because you can drink that and it can be right back to being what 17 18 in my living room with my dad having a special special drink and it was just you know it just it just brought you know that's that's the one whiskey that got me into it in a way uh and then I'm, I'm one of those people that's, you know, quite fortunate in a way to work with whiskey. And, and that really started, I was an auctioneer, so so I've got a bit of a strange background to some, so, so like I'm antiques and whiskey, but I think they're very much the same sort of things as we'll probably sort of discuss later, like in terms of the way that they're collected. So I got into my employment, which is as, a, as an auctioneer, by doing a degree and a master's in museum studies, essentially, in fine art. Amazing. And, but that was looking at about, the like the construct of value so like if you've got a painting by uh, picasso and a painting by your mum why is there a difference in price because fundamentally they're the same thing and, and and it's looking at the social construct of that value and we will get into this later you know <laughs> me and nick were chatting earlier and, and there's one bottle of black bowmore in particular which this sort of sentiment or sentiment sort of it works really well on. So anyway, I was auctioneering. Uh, I was an auctioneer for about 10 years uh, and I worked up at Tenants up in North Yorkshire and I set them up a wine and whiskey sale. And that was about 2013, maybe. And that's just, so just sort of pre the whiskey boom. So I set that whiskey sale for up for them, probably did a couple of million pounds worth of sales. And then I set up my business in 2016. And that was just that, like just as the whiskey market was starting to explode and We've kind of ridden the wave with it, really. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm now happily employed, self-employed, whatever, working with some of the most amazing bottles 
think casks that have ever been created. So it's a, yeah. Wow. Nice. Well, tell us a bit more about that then, Mark Littler Limited yeah. and what you guys do. So I set up in 2016. So rather than setting up another auction house, because, you know, another auction house is another auction house and having worked as an auctioneer, the, the, the problem is, it's like if a customer comes to your door, you have to say, sell it with us. You know, you're employed to get business in for that company. So you can't really start turning around and sort of saying, well, you should be working, you know, you should be sending this to Christie's and this to, you know, Anticorum and places like that. So you couldn't really be honest with the customers in a way. You, you could be, you could be, you know, you could be honest within the capacity of your job. But like if you let's zoom this out to whiskey, like if you contact whiskey auctioneer, for instance, they're not going to say, oh God, yeah, you should be selling this with bottoms. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> your job right. is to get this stuff in. So, so Mark Pillar Limited was a way, it was like a, I take from my wife's industry, she's a financial advisor. You know, if you inherit a large sum of money, you see an adv- an independent advisor and they tell you how to sell it. And that's what Market Limited does in essence. We're, we're, we're brokers, we're agents, we help people sell. And over the years, it's sort of really snowballed. And especially with the whiskey, because like the more the, the market's exploded, the more different services that we offer. So, you know, we can help people sell their bottles of whiskey and we can do it by a private sale, you know, like an immediate brokered sale. We can do it by auction. You know, we can say, help you get your collection to auction. And then we can put the bottles on our shop as well. So our shops was launched last year. Uh, we we had that vertical of Macallan 18 year old that for, sold for a, uh, for a chap up in Scotland, I don't know if you saw in the news, he was given a bottle of 18 year old Macallan every year for his birthday. Oh, yeah. oh, is that what vertical means? That's one thing I was going to ask later on, actually. You say, well, you use the term vertical in terms of a series yes. or a set and, and, a, and a vertical. What exactly is a vertical? So this is, this is language borrowed from the wine industry. So a vertical is one distillery or chateau and then all subsequent vintages. So Macallan 78, 79, 80, 81, right. 82, 83. Now, you get a horizontal as well, just to confuse things, but a horizontal might be all your first growth wines like Lafitte, Latour, uh, Mouton Rothschild, but all the same vintage. So, but yeah, that, 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 that 18-year-old vertical that we saw, I mean, it was at headlines everywhere, but, you know, essentially, the problem with whiskey is that it's a drug. You know, let's, let's, you know, selling it without the right licenses, it's £20,000 fine and six months in prison, you know. It's restricted. Now, the retailers kind of have a monopoly on this industry, retailing whiskey, because if you've got a bottle of whiskey, you can either sell it at auction or, I mean, you can come to us and we can broker the sale, but there's no way to compete with the retailers because you can't put it on eBay because of your licensing laws. But our shop is now a way for, for people. It's like that intermediary step. The prices are higher than auction, but less than retail. So as a seller, you're going to get more than you would do again, buying at auction. And as a buyer, you're saving significantly on over, over, over retail prices. Right. But that's just the bottles. <laughs> that's just the bottles. So we do, uh, 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 you know, we help people invest in bottles. You know, we help people sell casks. We've sold millions of pounds worth of casks for people who were investing in the 1990s and 2000s. And also we help people buy casks as well. Okay. So do you work directly with distilleries as well? Could, do you sell for distilleries or is that not a thing? No, we don't sell for distilleries. They 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 have their own sales programs, if that makes sense, right. with their own salespeople. But I mean, we, you know, if, right, okay, if you're looking for an investment, if we talk, because we're going to be talking about a lot, about, a lot about whiskey as an investment with this sort of thing, like, let's look at the money analogy. You've got 20 grand to spend. You go to your financial advisor and you say, I want to buy stock in blue chip battery technology and it's like okay when are you buying today now 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 they say well hang on a minute you would wait for the right opportunity to arise because people when they say they're going to invest in whiskey they think they're being sort of quite diverse but actually it's an an extremely risky area to be in you know we're not fca regulated you know you could invest in diageo well easier and with a lot more comfort than you could buying a cask or bottle for many reasons but it's we tend to try and get people the advice because I think our whole remit and it's like everything that we do on the blog, on YouTube and stuff, it's just that, you know, we like educating people. I'd rather someone didn't buy a cask or a bottle but knew what they were getting themselves into than just trying to sell. And, and that's sort of like where our consultancy side, because we do consult for customers as well, comes in because there isn't many people giving like that. I don't want to say open and honest advice, but I think that's really what it is. Yeah, I'd rather tell you, absolutely no chance don't buy you, you know go go invest in something safer than, than actually force you to buy some whiskey that we're selling 
Or perhaps drink it, right? Um, <laughs> now that's dangerous. I was going to ask you about that because a lot of what you do maybe is convincing, well, a lot of people say that whiskey's for drinking, you know, and yeah. then a lot of your job might be either convincing them that it's not or <laughs> being like, you know what? Yeah, this ain't worth it. Drink that one. Yeah, and like this comes back to our analogy with our antiques earlier. Okay, so you've just spent 20 grand on a Rolex Submariner. If you spent that, because you're really fastidious about keeping the time. Like, does it matter how accurately that Rolex keeps time? No, no. The reason why you bought that watch was because it's a status it will imbue you and the timekeeping capacity of it is secondary because a Rolex, the self-winding, if you don't keep it in a watch winder, it'll stop when you need to readjust the date. Like, you know, your, your, your phone watch will keep better time your your casio your 999 casio will keep better time and, and this is the sort of thing that we need to as a community as a whole we need to appreciate that whiskey isn't just a drink anymore and like we do like drinking whiskey but we're probably one of the only people in the industry that's sort of saying you know the industry themselves are pushing this investment angle on a lot of people without people really knowing, you know, and there's lots of commentators saying that whiskey is just for drinking and the investors are bad. Fine. Okay. So let me get you an example here. So this is a bottle. I'll hide the cask number. This is a sample from a, an Ardbeg cask that we just sold from. It's a 1994 Ardbeg. And you can see this is how the sample comes direct from the distillery when you receive it. This was stored at Springbank. So it's got that, it just says Ardbeg 1994 and it's got a duty sticker. Now, and it's just a standard tour round bottle. If whiskey is for drinking, that's how whiskey retailers and, and whiskey producers should be selling their whiskey. Like the label isn't relevant. But the fact is, is that like we'll use Macallan as an example. How does an elite crystal decanter enhance the flavor of the whiskey? You know, how does like if you look at the concept series, for instance, on the promotional pages of the Macallan site, it barely even talks about the whiskey. You know, the decanters, the big fancy boxes like on the folio series and stuff, does that enhance the whiskey? Of course it doesn't. Glenn Fiddick teaming up with an artist to design unique pairs of, you know, Jordan trainers, does that enhance the whiskey? No. You know, so while, yes, I agree whiskey is for drinking and it's a shame for people not to enjoy it, I think the industry themselves are making products designed specifically for investors and collectors, especially with all these new limited editions, everything's you know, got a reason to buy it or a new edge on it. And like a lot of these distilleries, the new distilleries, I won't mention any by name, but there's several that play on misleading dates, if that makes sense. No. So they, they talk about the year that a famous event happened somewhere in and around the distillery site rather than the, the, the year that it was focused because they're trying to potentially enhance the perception of, of, of the brand in a okay. way, you know, the, his, the historic perception of the brand, which is fine. You know, we're all here. Like, I think we need to be fr front with this. Like, we're, we're, like, if we're in the West, we're pretty much all capitalists. Yeah. Diageo are there beholden to shareholders. Do they make and sell whiskey because it's nice for people to drink? Or do they make whiskey and sell it because it makes them and their shareholders a lot of money? You know, definitely because it's nice to drink, clearly. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, and how do they sell it? They sell it with decanters. They sell it with fancy packaging. And they, and they hook us in on all these different ways. And I think it's naive. Whiskey stones. Yeah. It, it's naive nowadays to think that whiskey is made simply for drinking. Because I think a lot of the producers make these whiskeys to not necessarily be consumed and it's like with these new distilleries they've got to sell their whiskey so they've got to try and make themselves more uh, uh, appealing which is fine you know you can't fake history and that's that's the sort of one thing that a lot of these why some of these old distilleries do so well you know mccallan is 1824 you know if it's springbank it's 1828 you know these these distilleries are seeped in history and you know that appeals especially to a lot of our asian clients they really like that historic connection to a place even though nothing that they're drinking is from those years. Exactly. Which yeah. is crazy, and, it, and it's, yeah. But I understand it. I do understand it to an extent, f for sure. But it's, it's about branding, isn't it? And, 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 you know, Nick and I have had these conversations so many times recently. Ultimately, branding is, uh, is a wonderful thing, I suppose, in terms of making money, right? Look, and and right. Find, it, finding your audience, etc. Whiskey Magazine. Issue 13, I've got it here for you. Page 82, 
you've got the ultimate McAllen tasting here. So you've got the McAllen 1926 60 year old. So this is the whiskey that's in the one and a half million pound bottle of whiskey. Right. Michael Jackson, the whiskey reviewer, you know, very famous whiskey reviewer before he died, scored at eight. David Robertson, the ex-master distiller of, uh, of McAllen and the, and the current master distiller when this article was written, nine and a half. So eight and nine and a half. Interestingly enough, they both score the McAllen replica 1874 better than that 1926. <laughs> You know, nine and a half and nine, which ironically, the replica series and the inspiration series was based on fakes that the distillery had bought. So you end up with a whiskey that's better than the one and a half million pound bottle of whiskey rated higher, also rated lower than whiskey that was based on fake Macallan whiskey from the 19th century. It's, it's, and like what you've said about branding is really important because this is a key thing, like, and a point that we've sort of made a few times is that quality, no one gives a crap about quality. You know, it, it, it does matter at a certain end of the market when you're consuming whiskey. No one wants yeah. to drink bad whiskey. But here's an instance, for example, and again, I know I'm showing a lot of things to the, to the video here, but we'll, we'll describe them. So that's a McAllen Private Eye miniature. Yeah. And that's the rest of the sample of the McAllen Private Eye because McAllen Private Eye is one of the first bottles that I ever sold. But McAllen Private Eye at auction, you know, recently 5,000, 5,200 pounds, zero tasting notes anywhere whatsoever online. You know, Serge hadn't done it. There was nothing on Whiskey Front. There was nothing even on Whiskey Base, really. So we, we bought this miniature and we paid Angus, Angus McRails uh, from uh, Whiskey Fun, and he's also a decadent drinks and the Whiskey mm -hmm. Sponge, et cetera, to do a, a Whiskey Fun tasting, essentially, or giving it a 100-point rating, 87, you know. So it's all right whiskey. I think <laughs> at the time, that was like uh, the same as like a 90-pound bottle of Linkwood. But the thing is, the point getting this back to branding is the value of private eye has less to do with whiskey than it has to do with branding. Whereas with wine, if you look at this in a different way, like when a, when a critic like Robert Parker, the wine advocate, Jancis Robson gives the wine 100 points, the price instantly jumps up in value because the price is directly correlating to the quality of the product. But with whiskey, again, I'm sure Nick will mention this one about the Black Bow more later, quality has no difference, makes no relevance in, in you know, it makes no difference to the price. It's just branding. And I think in the whiskey world, especially branding is, is really, really taking over. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. So we, for example, I mean, this isn't necessarily talking about investment things, but we've definitely talked about the status symbol involved with high end whiskies. For example, Johnny Walker blue, in my opinion is a okay whiskey, but not a 200 pound bottle of whiskey, but because of how they brand it and how they've marketed it, they they sell loads of it. Yes. Um, and it's interesting. I know that's not so much of an investment thing. Some of the, there's probably some rare Johnny Walker Blue, I'm sure. But that side of it is so important and people are so fickle in terms of buying stuff like that. But I get it if it's an investment. I don't, well, you, I, I agree with what you said. If you're buying it to drink, I don't get it. I don't, uh, I think you're just getting suckered. If it, but sure, yeah. if it's an investment because you want to have a status of, oh, look, I've got this 60-year-old bottle of Macallan from whatever, uh, and I'm the only one who's got a bottle and it cost me a yeah. million and a half. You're the kind of person that wants to show off and have that kind of thing. Fine, be that yeah. person. Uh, but, you know, and I doubt they're ever going to drink it fine yeah. a lot of people see it as artwork as well yeah, I mean, I've, watched, and that's I've, fine. I've seen grand design episodes where a guy had a motorbike on the wall like a ducati on the wall as a piece of art that's not fulfilling its purpose if you're looking at motorbikes it's meant to get you from a to b but for him it was a piece of artwork it's the same for a lot of these whiskey bottles it's a piece of art exactly. and a status symbol to have on their wall or and, it, and it's that collecting habit it's the nature of collectors in a way like people collect stamps, they collect books, they collect jewelry, they collect anything. And, and I think a lot of people collect whiskey. And this is like on, on our YouTube channel, we sort of talk about the concept of the whiskey having one value and the bottle having another value. So the whiskey can be crap, but the bottle have a fantastic value because, you know, it's all to do with that whole thing. And it's like, if you're collecting and you're filling gaps and things, and this is why a lot of distilleries now are releasing sort of like series, like the Bimba Spirit of the Underground, you know, that was the most recent one I can sort of recall of being like a really cool concept you know really nice artwork really good concept that gels together you, you know and it's part of a set it's part of a collection and we collect these things we're habits you know it's habitual mm. sort of thing it's 
I defy anyone to have enough room to have a bottle for every station of the underground, though. When they eventually have done the whole of the underground, if anyone has got every single bottle, well, it will be worth a fortune, but where do you store that? You're going to have, like, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. It's like uh, the folio series. So people started going crazy when they announced that they're going to do 24 folio releases. They're massive. They're absolutely huge. Like by the time you're in the outer cardboard box and everything protected with you, you literally need room of your house to store them all. And it's, you know, one of the benefits of like whiskey in the same with like diamonds and watches, it's portable wealth. You know, like got some bottles over here, you know, got like a, a 19, 19, 50 year old spring bank, just shy of 40 K. But that's forty k in one bottle, you know, that you can put on your shelf. It's, if you if you're a very wealthy person, it fits easy. It's portable wealth. It's simple. It's straightforward. Buy another car, or uh, you know, it, it's something else to store. And, and, and typically, you'll find that the smaller the the work, you know, the smaller the item, the more appealing it is to high net worth individuals. So you look at cars, for instance. You know, if you've got ten million pounds to spend, you, you could buy quite a few extremely good cars for that caliber. Then you've got to garage them. Then you've got to store them. Whatever. You buy a painting, it's one painting on the wall in one of your houses, you're done. You know, you're utilising that well. Right. I've got another question here, which shows the practical side of my brain. Insurance. A bottle of whiskey worth 40 grand is clearly yep. very breakable. So the, yes. the premiums for that have got to be higher than, say, a piece of art, which is worth 40 grand. No, no. no. No, no, That's so nuts. I'm not. Uh, no, so I'm not endorsed by this company or anywhere. I'm not getting a, a, an affiliate thing. But there's a company called Bruce Stevenson up in Scotland, and they'll give you a hundred thousand pounds worth of cover, all risks for your whiskey collection for three hundred and fifty-two pounds per year or one off fee per year. So right, per okay. year. So so. But like, if you imagine if you're trying to insure a hundred thousand pound car or a hundred thousand pound artwork, it's a lot more expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. You're listening to Whiskey and Things. Should we move on to talking a little bit about cask investment? I think uh, we've briefly mentioned it. Now, Nick and I have talked about this with a couple of our guests. And uh, the first time we ever spoke about this, we had no idea what we were on about. The second time, we'd read a little bit more and uh, we'd seen some uh, publications such as Cask and Skill magazine and Forbes and Whiskey magazine, which had put out quite extensive things about the pitfalls of this and you've already mentioned that there are a couple of these kind of things so obviously you've said it's unregulated already but what are your views on the current state of that side of whiskey investment and certain practices that have been going on for example so i think the first thing to to address is like is cask investment bad for the industry no i don't think it is if it's done properly which we'll talk about next i think it's very good you know if you look at all the independent mccallan if you look at all the independently bottled spring bank and brookladdies mm. and Aaron's at the moment you know there's some amazing ben nevis 96 is coming out you know that's all coming about because of the private investment schemes that these companies ran in the 1990s and 2000s you know the problem is nowadays is that and, and you know the reason why i can talk with any sense of authority about cask investment is that we've helped hundreds and hundreds of people exit their cask investments. So one of the biggest sides of the business is helping people exit their cask investments. So this is people who bought cask in the 1990s and 2000s and are now looking to sell. That's what we do. That's what we specialize in. And we've seen what's gone wrong. And in many occasions, the problems have happened and occurred when the company did not give the individual a delivery order. And this is what we've, we've been, you know, I think some of our YouTube videos on this go back to 2019. I think, you know, we've been talking about delivery orders for a very long time. And essentially, the biggest problem with the cask investment world now is that people aren't getting ownership of their casks. They're getting title to them. Yeah. And there's technically nothing stopping that. The only thing stopping that is having a warehouse that will open up a private account. And if you don't have a warehouse that will open up your private account for your customer, then in my opinion, you shouldn't be selling them a cask because if you can only pass title like or rights instead of ownership, th that's the big thing. And like, it's not just sort of me, you know, we started all of this and then Blair Bowman amazingly got the press to pick it up in a big way with that cask and still magazine article. We were quoted in the Forbes one. And, and this is the odd thing. Like we're getting the daily mail talking about the dangers of cask investment nowadays and yet we're not getting anything from higher powers in terms of like SWA or HMRC. You know, the Scotch Whiskey Association guidance says, page three or something of their current advice, get a delivery order. But what they actually sort of saying there is, 
get confirmation from the warehouse that the cask is in your name. Because the biggest problem that people face with cask investment if they don't get this delivery order, it's not now. It might not be in five years' time. But what happens if HMRC clamps down on these companies that are using one Wauga registration? And, and essentially, a Wauga, you may have heard of it, your listeners may have heard of it. It, it is for registered keepers of goods, the duty suspended goods. The, the legislation covering that is Excise Notice 196, specifically Section 5.2 is what we're referring to here. And it says if you're, if you're not a revenue trader, if you're not a business, then you don't need a Wauga. So legislatively, you don't need a Wauga to own a cask. So, so there's no reason why these companies can't get you a delivery order. What a lot of these companies are doing, though, is using their one Wauga certificate. And, and a Wauga is basically to... Uh, so HMRC can keep track of who's owning all these duty-suspended goods. Because obviously, there's a lot of duty and VAT to pay. So if you imagine like a diagram, you've got a big central sun of, of HMRC, and you might have 100 lines going off it to 100 smaller planets. So HMRC knows who owns these goods. But the problem is, is that some of these smaller companies, some of these smaller planets, we say, are then using that one license to store casks for three, four, 500 people, maybe 1,000 people. It just makes a mockery of the system, in my opinion, because HMRC can't see who's responsible for those goods. Because if you're telling your customers that you've got rights to it and it's held by you, then they're responsible. But if HMRC come knocking, it's that company. And if HMRC decide to clamp down on this side of things, then all of these people who have been buying casks without getting a delivery order, they may, might get a letter to say, yeah, you need to find a warehouse that will store your casks in 90 days or it, the goods are going to be forfeited. And that is the problem. You know, no delivery order equals no ownership. It's kind of like renting a car instead of buying one. It, 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 they're completely different things. Yeah. I was, uh, I was thinking about it as in like, you know, in Fast and Furious where they race for pink slips, you know, they race for yeah. the ownership of the car. The delivery order for me is the pink slip, how I see exactly. it. Yeah. It's like you've, yeah, your V5, it's like when you buy a house, you wouldn't just buy a house and walk into it. You'd get the land, you'd get the transfer updated by the land registry. And it's the same with the cask and, and the real, the, the risk of fraud here. I think there's two sides of fraud in the cask investment market at the moment. The first side of the fraud are companies deliberately misleading customers as to whether or not they have owned the cask or just rights to it or misleading them about the legislation. You know, they're saying you need a Wauga to own this, but clearly you don't. I think that possibly constitutes fraud. But then the other side of it is that, you know, if you're buying a cask from a company and you're not getting a delivery order, how do you know that cask exists? How do you know that's not being sold 30 times over? Yeah. Another thing mm. as well, should there be regulation, one, in general, and also in terms of advertising a possible like returns of the old 582%? Thing, yeah. It's so, very misleading, isn't it? Because they're talking, especially with cask investment, when that was from a, a bottle, for example. Yes. Two things there. Does it need regulation? We're heavily regulated already. You know what I mean? The, the problem is, is that people are abusing the regulations as they stand. You know, I've seen people trying to explain away the fact that a certificate will do by, mi by misinterpreting deliberately the Scotch Whiskey Association's current guidance, because they say traditionally warehouse, you know, traditionally ownership was transferred with a delivery order. Nowadays, a certificate may suffice, which is correct if it's the warehouse that's issuing a certificate to do the transfer. Now, don't get me wrong, there's no legislative structure around the delivery order. If a warehouse keeper who's, who's responsible for the warehouse says that, right, Nick, you've bought this cask, you've got to meet me on the third Sunday after a full moon and kiss me on the elbow and I'll transfer the ownership, that's it. You know what I mean? The warehouse keeper's gospel. So if you're a distillery, for instance, so a lot of these modern cask ownerships by the distilleries, you know, they will give you a certificate, which is perfect because they own the warehouse and they can update their records in their warehouse. But the warehouse... You know, if you're buying from a third party, you still need that feedback from the warehouse that it's been transferred. So I think there's an abuse of the already regulated market as it is. And when it comes back down to that 500% returns, again, it's just, again, it's another instance of fraud. That's people using the data from the Knight Frank Index, which uses Rare Whiskey 101's data about old and rare bottles. Like, so they're trying to compare the returns on old and rare bottles of whiskey to casks, which is grossly misleading. It's probably quite fraudulent. And again, it comes down to the fact that, yeah, that should be regulated. But come on, like, 
you know, you've got Forbes, Cask and Stone magazine, Whiskey magazine, the Daily Mail. Uh, I think it's been in the Sunday Times. It's been in the Sunday Mail. It's been in so many other, like This Is Money did an article on it. And yeah, whiskey and things. Go- mm-hmm. Whiskey and things, yeah. importantly. <laughs> but no, like where's, where's that higher voices? It's coming down to people like me and Blair Bowman to really sort of champion this. And we're doing this because like, you know, as I said all along, my, my key thing here with this business is to educate. And it's, I, I just think there should be sort of some voices from higher up that sort of give feedback onto this. Or a prosecution. There's been loads of them though. There's been oh, loads, right. Dave. Like in the 1990s, like Cavendish Wines, they were shut down, serious fraud office. They were selling casks of Macallan for £3,000, which at the time were worth seven fifty on the market. You know, they were shut down for fraud. Loads of people didn't get a delivery order. So they went sort of under. There's been a, there's been so much, but this is it. And like, this is why I feel like I'm banging my head on a wall sometimes because all the same tactics that we used in the 1990s and 2000s I mean, that were shut yeah. down by the serious fraud office were back again. You know what I mean? And like, I'm talking about cask investment, but I can help people buy a cask. So people might take my opinion as like, I'm just trying to take another position to enhance my sales. And it's not, it's like we made our whiskey cask purchasing model on the Scotch Whiskey Association regulations and worked forward from that, not how we can get away with it and move forward from that. Yeah. So, and to, <laughs> it's such a weird thing, isn't it? Cause we start, you, you mentioned earlier about capitalism and how we we are all capitalists in this country, essentially, and that's 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 true. But it's having a moral compass, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, you know, how can I screw people over versus how can I help someone make some money legitimately, and, and I can make some money in the process as well. And and yeah. and and you shouldn't have to screw someone over in order to make money. You know, you, no. everyone can be a winner, right? Exactly. And that's the thing. And it's like casks can be a fantastic investment. And again, like if you look at our reviews on Google, we've got hundreds of five star reviews. We've, we've got the experience at the real important end of helping people exit their investments. So we know it's worked for them and we know how it's worked and we know why it's worked. And that's why we have sort of like the expertise that we do. But to blanket around like, the, like people sort of trying to sell new made casks and stuff, it's like, you know, you're going to be waiting at least 18 years. You know, there isn't a magic button that says oh it gets to eight years old it's gone up in value or 10 years old no like it's like we've got a cast calculator on our website that you can click into and it's like I, I, my numbers are a bit hazy here but if you had a hogshead at say two and a half thousand pounds i think your bottle price will come out at 36 pounds a bottle if you double the price of that cast to five thousand pounds your bottle price is now 43 and if you make the cask worth zero i think it's like 28 because the reality of it is, is that in any bottle of whiskey, the most of the cost is the VAT and the duty. Mm-hmm. So if you stick your cask into our cask calculator, even at like two and a half grand, you've got to get to like 38, 43 pounds as a minimum viable product for a wholesaler. So what age is that going to be? It's probably going to be at least 12 years old because, you know, look on Diageo, their, their uh, accelerator program. I think it's, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's on the cask calculator, but they say as a retailer, or a wholesale, you need to leave in a 50 to 60% margin. So that £40 a bottle is now £60 before you're breaking even. So if you're buying a cask at zero, you need to be looking at when would that whiskey be able to be sold at retail for £60 a bottle. And of course, one of the biggest tricks of the book with the whiskey investment is when they sort of give you a cask and they say, oh yeah, it's £3,000 and there's 250 bottles in there. It's, well, you know, it's what's that, £3,500. So I'm going to do this on a calculator because I will get this wrong. Uh, and there's 350 bottles in there. It's ten pound a bottle. It's an easy one. That I couldn't believe we've done it. Been a long day. It's not a tenner a bottle because you've got to add duty, you've got to add fat, you've got everything else in there, and, and it's just sort of that that sort of like slight manipulation there again. You're listening to whiskey and things, and to help people out, you've recently put out the whiskey bottle investment guide is that right oh i know it's not necessarily about casks but so yeah so a couple of years ago we released our whiskey cask investment guide which is like no nonsense straight talking cask investment and then this is what we've just done with the bottles because you know it it took us the best part of six months to make it's like twenty four thousand words it's 82 pages long and it's a free download so if you head to our website it's a return ferry to belfast in terms of reading that's when i did it this weekend it's a good read i enjoyed it Thanks. Uh, I understood more than I thought I was going to, to be honest. Um, but there's some really cool stuff. And yeah, please uh, explain, kind of uh, give us an outline on what's in it and what people can expect. I mean, 
I think one of the, the, the key sort of things with, with whiskey investment is that data without context is dangerous. So the analogy that we sort of say is like 100% of people who drink Scotch whiskey die. You know, <laughs> that is a fact. And it's not a, it's not a figure that the Scotch industry goes around town well, no, to. You need to check your figures on that one. <laughs> but so. it's true. It's 100% true. But there's a difference between correlation and causation. So everybody who drinks, so everybody's going to die. That's, that's a fact. And then therefore everybody who drinks whiskey will die. But the thing is, you've got the life experience to know that it's probably not the Scotch whiskey that's killed you. There's probably lots of other contributing factors that led to that person's death. Okay, they were hit by a car, but they still drank whiskey. You, you know what I mean? And, and that's the same with whiskey investment, as you've alluded to already with the numbers. You know, just because the numbers look great, you've got to have an understanding of the market and what's around those numbers in order to appreciate whether it's a good investment or not. So that's why we launched the bottle investment guide to try and add that context and understanding because but let's be frank, a lot of people like whiskey as an investment. A lot of people like collecting whiskey. But where's where like who's who's writing about it? Who's doing the guidance? You've got a manual drones book, which is phenomenally good, but it's about four hundred pounds and it doesn't really educate you on the market. We we sort of try to fill that gap in the in the education there, in the learning and understanding of how the markets developed from the eighties and nineties to two thousands, and it also kind of gives you a toolkit about what, how and what to collect really as well. Mm. So are these guides free? So yeah, so that that big investment guide there, that's a free download. You can buy it on Amazon. I think it's about one pound thirty, or you can download it free of charge on our website. And then we've also alongside that, we've just started our whiskey investment reports. So the, these aren't. So you've got the big guide, 80 odd pages, and then we've got the reports, which are like paid for downloads. So we've done one on the private eye and we've done one on the folio series. And this is really putting the data that's available out there into context. And I think that's the important thing because a lot of people are buying these folio series, for instance, and like, it, you know, the, the average price for folio one across the first half of 2021 was 7,750, I think, you know, that's nearly two and a half grand more than the average price of the Macallan 1957, 25 year old anniversary moat released in 1983. And it's like, you come back to these, what's, what's the fundamental aspect that's propping up this value? Okay, 1957, early vintage, 25 year old, high age statement released in 1983. Okay, very scarce, very few on the market. Understandable. Folio one, what's propping up the market there? It's a six-year-old, no age statement whiskey, released for £199, and it's growing at a rate of not, you know, many thousands percent of growth since its original release price. And, and that's the danger here. There's a lot of modern whiskey investment, the flipping side of the market, which is based, in my opinion, a lot on the greater fool theory. You know, people are buying these because they're seeing the values going up and there's a greater fool out there that's prepared to buy it. And mm. I think if you got in early doors with the folios, happy days. But when you consider that the folio one is more expensive than like the private eye, the royal marriage, you, you know, the 25 year old anniversary malts, you've got to think, well, hang on, like there's an unbalance here. Like what's driving this growth? Why are people paying so much for it? And that's what the reports, the 25 pounds each, there's a hundred percent money back guarantee on them. So if you don't like them, you get a full refund. And it's just to try and help people because I think a lot of people are jumping in and they're going to be burned because they don't have that understanding. Yeah, this is all blowing my mind a little bit. Yeah, it's um, it's a good guide. I mean, it's a world I don't really know much about, but I understood everything and it gave me a good background actually on a lot of whiskey history I didn't know. You know, about why McAllen's kind of got in there, uh, like while they're always wanting to be collected because there's a certain... Um, you might want to explain it better than me, like the whiskey lock. When there was a lot of whiskey around, they were still making yeah. loads, so there's still a lot to be collected out there. Explain that a bit better than I probably just have, if you could. So I think McCallan, so McCallan are really the first one. So Glenn Fiddick, so we've got to remember, like until at least the 1980s, and, and still now, really, blended whiskey is still the biggest sector of the market. But until the 1980s, it was blended whiskey pretty much the whole way. It wasn't until 1963 that the first single malt whiskey that was advertised in England, you know, that was Glenn Fiddick. You know, the, 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 and McCallan really was sort of pioneering in a way that they, you know, the anniversary malt, the 25 year age, you know, 25 year age statement whiskey, they were started in 1983, I think it was. And they created this series of whiskies, 83, 84, you know what I mean? Every year they would release a new one. Again, that hook, you've got a collector, right? I want one from every year. And McCallum, they had the stocks, you know, they had the, they had the reserves to do that. And that's the point when most of the distilleries were just about releasing a core age statement 
for the mass market. But Macallan sort of really, their whiskey appeals to a lot of people. That sherry oak influence is very beautiful. You know what I mean? It makes mm-hmm. this great whiskey. But a lot of people forget, like, I think it was until 2018, a single bottle of whiskey hadn't sold for more than £100,000 at auction. And now it's like 1.5 million. You know, you said in the guide that the kind of peak of the uh, well, was 2018 in terms of sales in the industry. Do you think that's going to come yeah. back up again or is it just going to kind of plateau now? Yeah, we're back at it. I think this year is going to be another peak. You know, when you look at the data and you look at the graphs. So if you look like again, in, 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 if you, in our reports, you'll see the graphs as the data for all these bottles. So like if you look at Private Eye, kind of rides the wave up 2018 then dips and then it's sort of risen again. And, you know, that's an interesting pattern that can replicate itself across a lot of different bottlings. So I think we're going for another peak. But again, that growth has sort of come slowly. You know, private eye, it's five grand now, but it's taken 25 years to get there, if that makes sense. Folios have got more than that in less than six years. Mm, That's crazy. And I think one of the things that highlight the biggest unbalances of the market is one of the bottles that we talk about in the guide, and it's the the Black Bowmore third edition. Yes, interesting. Black Bowmore third edition. You can buy it at auction for about eleven grand. Now, despite the fact that Black Bowmore said the final edition was the third edition, and then released a fourth edition, and then a fifth edition, and then <laughs> it, then they released like a collaboration with Aston Martin, the DB five edition. Now, in the same month that the third edition sold for eleven thousand pounds, the DB five edition sold for eighty one thousand pounds, and it's a rebottling of that third edition. So it's the same whiskey making £70,000 difference in price. And that's not the biggest absurdity. The biggest absurdity is the 19, 19, 50 year old. We've got a video of it on our YouTube channel and we've got one on up for sale at the moment. I think it's about 38,000. Yes, yeah, a lot of money, 38 grand, but it's 19, 19 and it's a 50 year old. Springbank rebottled that a few years after they made that original bottling release. And one of those sold again, I think it was 2018, it was at Sotheby's, for £266,000. So you're looking at what? You're looking at a £225,000, £228,000 difference in price for the same whiskey in two different bottles. It's a pretty bottle though, to be fair. But uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I see your point. <laughs> and, it's like, no, you know, and this comes back to the point, is whiskey for drinking? Well, if you're going to drink it, what's it worth? 38 grand or 266? Yeah. yeah. And is the empty bottle worth 226? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But with yes. that though, like re- releasing whiskies after they said it was going to be the final edition, this is the final one. And then a few years later coming out with another edition. It's a bit of a, I don't want to say con, but it's a bit misleading. It is a con. Um, well, it's like, I've made the analogy earlier on where, um, it's like a band announcing a farewell tour. And then doing a farewell, tickets. farewell tour. And then no, they're going for like 10 years more, you know. Yeah. It's a bit like that. Yeah, it's, it's like we've got one whiskey, let's see what we can do. Oh, let's do it in another edition. And and this is what I feel like a lot of modern distillery, or sorry, not modern distillery, a lot of modern distillery releases are like at the moment. It's like, oh, we've got a single cask X, Y, and Z. Oh, great. Well, you did one of them two weeks ago. Like, yeah. well, give, give me yeah. something new. You know what I mean? It's... But those original Beaumores, the one, two, and three, weren't they like 60 quid, 80 quid, and 100 pound or something when they Pretty first Pretty much between 80 and 100 pounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And like Private Eye was 36 pounds. The 25-year-old anniversary malt was leased at 25 pounds for the 25-year-old and 50 pounds for the 50-year-old. Interestingly, and because I'm really anal and like this sort of stuff, last week, uh, Gordon and McPhail sold the world's oldest whiskey for, eight, uh, for 140,000 pounds at Sotheby's. It was the 80-year-old generation's Glenlivet. The RRP on that bottle is 80 grand for an 80-year-old whiskey. But then, right. like, sort of unpacking this a little bit further, you know, one of the bottles on our shop at the moment, it's a Gordon and McPhail Glenlivet Book of Kells 50 year old, and that's priced at just over four grand. Look at the comparisons between that 80 year old. Okay, it's both bottled by Gordon and McPhail. Yep. It's both from the 1940 vintage. Yep. It's both in a nice decanter. Yep. Okay, one of them's like 30 years older, and like that's not to be taken lightly. That, that, 80 year old age statement is phenomenal, but how can there be sort of like a hundred and hundred, you know, 136 grand discrepancy, a 50 year old Glen Livet from 1940 has got to be worth more than four grand. And this is what like people looking at whiskey investment need to sort of do. And this is what our reports are aiming to do. It, it, you know, you can make a profit by buying something and flipping it for a profit, but that's sort of like cheap investment. It's not clever in a way. 
it, it, it's, it's effective, but it's not necessarily using much market insight. If you look at people who trade equities, for instance, they look at companies and they look at them in great deal and they see what's undervalued in the market and things like that GNM bottling are massively undervalued in my opinion. Same with that Springbank 1919, the pear-shaped one. You know, it, it's looking for these things and that's what we do and that's what we, you know, we talk about on YouTube a fair bit as well and it's, it's yeah, I like, I like it anyway, so. It's quite fascinating to be honest, isn't it? Yeah. Hey Nick, I thought of uh, another music analogy for you. Oh yeah, yeah All right. So you know, you know how we have the rebottlings, which were worth more. Yeah. Okay. So it's like if you look at the ticket price of the last time Queen performed with Freddie Mercury, like fourteen pounds. Yeah. Like the original. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. And now look at what Queen go out for with Adam Lambert as a singer, who's not Freddie Mercury and has never been on any decent Queen record. <laughs> Uh, uh, as good as he is, and uh, and look at the inflation rate, and realise that they're overselling their pro- current product by a long way. Right. Yeah. There you go. You're That's welcome. Good analogy. That nineteen twenty six fifty uh, sixty year old, you know, the, the the world record bottle of whiskey, the Macallan one point five million. That's a rebottling. You know what yeah. I mean? There is there are several. It, it's so this is what I mean, like about like the industry. You know, people giving some investors and collectors a hard time, but the reality of it is, they're only consuming products that are being designed specifically for them to collect and invest in. You know what I mean? And and like, do they bring good to the industry? Yes, I think they do. You, you know what I mean? Like most distilleries now sell out their releases automatically, like that Bimba Spirit of the Underground. It was well oversubscribed. It was like and and go back sort of five years ago, these releases were just sort of trundling along and. Yes, these collectors and investors, they, they, their intentions might not be so, so perfect or pure in terms of they're going to drink the whiskey and consume it, but I think it's a gateway drug. They come in with the gateway drug of earning money off flipping some whiskey, but then they come into the sector and they start, ah, actually, I quite like whiskey. I'm not going to drink this one, but I'm going to go and buy like a 12-year-old. And then mm. they get into it and they start listening to podcasts and they start reading more magazines and they start watching more YouTube channels. And, you know, whiskey is big business. You know, these... Why does Bentley and McAllen need to collaborate? Of course they don't. You know, it Bentley aren't going to enhance the flavor of any whiskey, but it's a nice <laughs> brand association bringing their clients to each other. It's massive money. Come on. You know, and I think it's a good thing if it's done right. Same with cask purchasing or cask investment, whatever you want to call it. One of the best opportunities of your life will be tasting whiskey from one cask as it matures and seeing how that wood is affecting the influence of that whiskey. You know, it's a fascinating experience to see. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, if I had money, I'd love to buy a cask. I'm not going to lie; I think it would be a lot of fun, uh, and then to also have have something to bottle in, in in so many years. I think that whole experience would be wonderful, but don't have the money. Yeah. One thing I thought was quite fun, actually. One thing in the guide was um, the websites you can use to kind of help you experience and stuff. And there was a thing on that you mentioned that Whiskey Hunter, where they have a collection yeah. tracker, yeah, where you can put your collection in, and then it basically shows you how it's going up and down, you know, yes. in value yeah. and stuff. That sounds like a fun part. What I want to take out of this is it's another part of whiskey being fun. Some people want to drink it and have fun. Some people see it as a bottler and as an investment. But it needs to be fun at the end of the day. And it's little things like that, like seeing an investment go up. Of course, it's going to go down at some yeah. point as well. But, you know. And if you can buy two bottles, and like what we're, you like, we, like, let's be sure, like, we do drink whiskey here. You know, like, one of our things on YouTube, we do like these round robin bottles where yes. essentially I, I do an investment talk about the bottle. You know, we had a 12 year old Yamazaki from the 1980s, which can pick up for like two or 300 pounds at auction. But we send it around all your reviewers and all your creators and influencers, whatever you want to call them. You know, we've done it with an edition six. Uh, we've got one of the Bimba Spirit of the Undergrounds going around, and we've got a load more sort of plans to go. We've got a Middleton, uh, very rare, 2021, ready to sort of go out as well. Yeah, we're looking forward but to it's that. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're <laughs> this, guys, definitely. <laughs> but it's like it's a way for us all to sort of share a communal jam because like these festivals haven't been the same as what they were, and it's like you know it's all well and good talking about whiskey. But at the end of the day, we all like with drink, you know, drinking it. But like me and Nick were talking earlier, and it's like I can, I like whiskey. Yeah, can I describe it in four hundred? No, of course I can't. I, like I'm kind of like the car salesman, not the mechanic. You know, the mechanic <laughs> can tell you what's wrong with the car and rip it apart, and like you know, use that an analogy with the nose. He can tell you the terroir, this, that, and the other. I'm kind of like the sales guy in a way. I know all about the product and I fully understand the market. The only part of me that isn't a car salesman is sort of like the salesman aspect because we just like teaching people, you know, it's that education. Because yeah. the thing is, if, if a product is good enough or a proposition is good enough, it should sell itself. It doesn't need a salesperson. 
the whiskey. Right, so let's uh, let's make this very real now. So we've talked about um, the fact that me and Nick have no money, but we do have whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, whiskey. you said about buying two bottles earlier, and we've mentioned Bimba a few times. It, for those of people who don't understand why Bimba stuff goes for value, it's because they're a small distillery and they get, they've got great reviews and it's just blowing up as a result and they don't release too much because it's only small, so on and so forth. Now, we are part of the Bimba Club and we got two bottles. We got a bottle each of the Bimba Club first edition. We opened one and shared it and we have one which isn't, isn't going to be opened yet. Is that going up? Is that worth anything? Or is that kind of thing not worth much because it's a little bit niche? So an interesting thing here, like you look at the value of the whiskey and your value of your bottle. So that Bimber of the Spirit at the Underground, it was 125 quid. Like I've tasted it. It's quite nice. It's a few other people, Vinnet Whiskey, uh, No Nonsense Whiskey, Phil uh, Whiskey Wednesday's done it, uh, Etienne at the Moat Cask has done it. It's all right. It, it's nice whiskey. Is it worth 125 quid? Might be pushing it a bit. Might be worth sort of 70, 100 quid, somewhere in that region. But then you see it going at auction for five, 800 quid. It's not five eight hundred quid whiskey. The, once that price jumps and it's no, and it doesn't bear any correlation to its quality, the only thing you really can do with it is is sort of sell it, you know. And like because it's like that private eye, is it good whiskey? Yes, yeah, all right, yeah. But it's not brilliant. It's not fantastic and perfect. And you've got to try this if that makes sense. It'll be something nice to enjoy, but it's not worth five and a half grand to drink if that makes sense. So with that bottle stick it aside, leave it for five years and see what happens. And I think Bimba are one of those distilleries where, you know, let's face it, they're bloody good at marketing. They're really good at marketing. My biggest issue, if you want to call it that, with English whiskey is the lack of regulation. You can import Scotch whiskey and label it as English whiskey. Didn't know that. And, and I think as, as long as that is in place, the, the, indus, you know, the English whiskey market will suffer. You, you know what I mean? It's, you know, you could bring in whiskey from anywhere. It doesn't have to be distilled and bottled in England. Like Scotch has to be distilled, matured and bottled in Scotland. So I think there's a bit of a, something to clear up there. And I think a lot of people as well, not a lot of people, I think certain people come to whiskey investing in the same way they do sort of like with this 2021 mentality of like Bitcoin and stuff. And it's like, I've got to make immediate gains. And it's like, if you look at the bottles that have performed the best over time, slow and steady growth, you know, slow and steady growth proven year on year like hundreds of percent growth each year isn't sustainable and, and the reality of it is and it's the same with cask investment and bottom investment if the returns were guaranteed if the returns could be quantified in any meaningful way you would have pension funds you would have hedge funds you would have alternative asset funds you would have venture capital all coming in and, and buying this on a wholesale thing especially with the casks why is a company selling you a cask saying it's the next best thing? It's because they don't have the data to go to a hedge fund or pension fund and say, buy a thousand casks at a time because whiskey is made in monumental volumes and a single cask is, is nothing. And that's the other, one of the other biggest sort of cons is that when people say, oh, the distilleries will buy it back. No, they won't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've never experienced a distillery buying back a cask at a good market price, if that makes sense. So buy it back at a price, but not at a good price, you know, VAT duty come into play. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. So with this though, if you talked about having uh, like collection sets in the in the guide and stuff, with in terms of collecting the ne this year's one and then the next year's one, would the set be worth a lot more? And if so, if it had the same bottle number, is that important as well? I wouldn't say so. No, I think the spirit like so with Bimber, I think the spirit of the underground is like my favorite release of theirs because it appeals to non-whiskey drinkers you, you mm -hmm. know what I mean you've got another hook you've got another people to sell to what happens if the reputation of Bimber drops massively you know it you don't want to be sort of caught and it's like those they're just sort of single cast releases and like and in many ways this comes down to the marketing hyperbole of lots of distilleries with modern releases it's all about trying to find another way to make you consume you know like the concepts are the, how are they different from the folios and how are they different from the editions? It's all no age statement whiskey, varying degrees of fancy packaging and collaborations. You know, it's just whiskey at the end of the day. It doesn't need all of this, but it's what we're sort of being told to sort of hold up, you know, hook into. So, and it's like the folio series. That, the, the genius with that is, is that is a series designed at celebrating the success of McAllen's marketing over the years. And it's one of the most, you know, profitable 
historically profitable bottles of risky out there. But it's, I think there's a microclimate around that bottle. I think we'll hopefully sort of see things correct themselves at some point with that because it's just well out of whack. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we have one other bottle between us which isn't worth anything, but might be, uh, but it definitely isn't. <laughs> <laughs> to some people, this is a thing. It's very specific, this one. Well, yeah, this one is specific. So I've got this bottle, and it's called Houston We've Had a Problem, single malt scotch whiskey. It's 13-year-old, and it's an it's a 50th anniversary celebration of the Apollo 13 mission. It's bottled by a company called thewhiskeybarrel.com, and it's from Highland Park. And they've done it, like this bottle number 169 of 322. They've since this one did well, so they've since done other Apollo releases with with other labels with images from space flight and stuff like that. This was gifted to me, um, but I believe they they sell for about sixty to hundred pounds. And there's a, now a, a little bit of a set about them. They don't last too long when they go on sale. Is that the kind of thing that may have value, or is that such a niche market that probably not? <laughs> I think that's quite like, so there's two sides to this. Like, yes, I think broadly speaking, it might go up in value. You know, it's got a few extra hooks on it. You know, it's got that sort of space affiliation with it, but it's not necessarily a, a licensed affiliation, if that makes sense. It's just yeah. somebody using that to sort of sell whiskey. And why are they doing that? They're trying to sell whiskey. Capitalism, they probably couldn't sell it if it just said Highland Park, come and drink it. You know, yeah. we come back. These people are making whiskey to sell and make money. How people deal with it is their own instance. But like, and, and, and this is where I think that like there's, there's sort of two sides potentially to investing in bottles, if that makes sense. And, and it comes back to any sort of side of collecting. And this comes back to the antique side of it. You've got accumulators and you've got investors. An accumulator, so with stamps, might buy packets of stamps and put them in an album. They might buy bottles of whiskey and hope they go up in value. But a collector will have a very narrow vision. They'll say they'll collect Victorian stamps. Or, you know, they'll collect stamps from British colonies from 1850 to 1950. And a whiskey investor, technically speaking, will have a strategy. They're going to collect an 18-year-old and a 25-year-old vertical and stuff like that. So there is a chance that that whiskey will go up in value. At the moment, pretty much anything that's released goes up in value. But again, you look at the fundamentals behind it and like what's driving it and you think, hmm, might need to calm down a bit. But, you know, we've got to look at this in time. Give that 10, 20 years, 25 years, it probably will be quite sought after, but we don't know how much really. It depends on how much that bottle it goes on to make the names themselves. Yeah. What you so need to do, Dave, you need to find it. out who else, no, who else <laughs> has that bottle, make friends with them and then drink theirs. that make your one, you know, rarer. Yeah, I might might set up a Facebook group for yeah, uh, yeah, for people who own who own space bottles of whiskey. <laughs> Appreciate them on, and then just slowly, <laughs> slowly worm your way in and, and drink their bottles of whiskey. Well, the odd bakes. Uh, which one was it? Now it's been a long day. I've been up since four, so it's quite late now. Uh, the 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 odd bag, There was a committee release, wasn't there? Was it the supernova or the Galileo that went up to space and it contained a, a, a yeah, bath in the small bottle? Yeah, yeah. It, you know it's cool. You know I like that. Me too. That is cool. Me yeah. too. <laughs> no surprise there. Right, so Nick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drink that bottle next time. You're going uh, to yeah, Abbey Road, yeah. I think, well, drink it with some space people. What? I don't have any space friends locally. <laughs> they oh, all live in America. That's all the line. Well, yeah. oh dear. Yeah. I don't know if any of them drink whiskey anyway, so I'd rather drink yeah. it with whiskey people. Okay. Anyway, anyway, we digress. I've got one last question. I have one last yeah. question for you. Um Whatever it is, you don't have to tell us or how much it costs, but whatever your personal most expensive whiskey is in your collection, what occasion would make you open it? Oh. I don't think... Oh, it's a tough one because I don't really enjoy expensive whiskey in a way. I like drinking whiskey. So like some of the best whiskies that I've had, you were talking about Blue Label, have been blends. I've got 90, I bought, so I had a company called Cheaper Buy the Dram at one point. We, we took bottles of whiskey, broke it down into drams and sold it. It did all right, but not, not fantastically. We had a white horse in there from 1958. Oh, absolutely stunning. You know what I mean? Like one of the most expensive bottles that I own, you know, probably a black Bowmore. Oh, what would make me open it? The market crashing. <laughs> no, it would have to be like a severe fright. Yeah, the market crashing or a big financial windfall because the reality of it is I can't afford to drink it. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, if you bought a Folio <laughs> 1 for £199, can you afford to open it? You know what I mean? If it's worth eight grand in an auction. You know, we, we did that on, a, on, on YouTube again. We opened the edition six and I think we bought it for like 80 quid. 
And I think now they're like a couple of hundred pounds at auction. Like that bimba, you know, we, we, we opened that. That was a 125 quid bottle to open. That was like, ah, you know, it's an expensive bottle of whiskey. And like you see it making seven, 800 pounds at auction. And it's like, what? But it's, it's you know, it's fine enjoying it, isn't it? And it's, yeah, but a very good question. Very good question. Well, Mark, this has been really, really entertaining and interesting and I've learned stuff and I've been thinking about how I wish I had some money. Um, So, yes, thank you very much for joining us. We hope to speak to you again sometime. I'm sure we will. Uh, But, yeah, just thank you. This has been absolutely wonderful. No, it's great for having me on and it's like it's it's nice to talk about the other sides of whiskey with people as well because it's like it's there is so much in the industry like those Glen Fiddick trainers like we've not really unpacked that a lot but come on like Glen Fiddick are collabing with trainers now you know what I mean it's yeah I didn't know that I haven't seen that yeah oh. they did a team up with a, an, an artist in Australia who makes custom uh, trainers I think he used Air Jordans for this instance so you've got an official Nike it's not, it wasn't in collaboration with Nike but you've got an official Glen Fiddick pair of Jordans out there on the market now and it's like you know what's going on seriously like this is a fascinating world there's more to to it than just drinking it like let's look at the madness of it the insanity and look at it for what it is absolutely fun it's fun it is fun as you said Nick it is fun it's all about the fun thanks Mark thank you super (laughs) whiskey well that was pretty special wasn't it Nick it was indeed lovely guy absolutely Absolutely. I hope we get him on again, maybe, because there's so much we could do about collecting whiskey, isn't there? So yeah. much. You can watch the full uncut video of that chat with Mark on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash whiskey and things. Yeah, or you can find out more about Mark Littler over on marklittler.com. Um, I've got a bunch of other links I'll be putting in the show notes as well. YouTube channel and all kinds of bits and pieces. Yeah, and the show notes, best place to find them is probably, if they, if they don't come up properly on your uh, podcast app, just head over to our website, which is whiskeyandthings.com. Anyway, Nick, I think uh, I think it's probably time to wrap up, isn't it? It's been, been, been loads today, loads. There has been loads. It's been a really interesting one. Um, I enjoyed reading that guide um, on the ferry. I went to Belfast, and, you know, it was a good little ferry read, and uh, I learned loads, even though I'm probably not going to get into whiskey and investment. <laughs> I don't even have the capital. <laughs> to be honest no. but it was it was really interesting but yeah I'm I'm good I'm good for this episode Dave I'm satiated maybe we could flip that bimba bottle and then use the use the profits to start investing <laughs> in another bimba but bottle maybe we can <laughs> if we can get yeah. on in maybe the next or, one of four bimba bottles <laughs> flip them you know oh god see how you can see how why people get around and start doing that kind of thing can't you anyway yeah, it's go. got your number on Nate so you can't People know what your bot number is. Yes. You get in trouble. You would get in trouble with Bimba. I'd be banned for a year. They do that now. If you flip it within a year. No, but not banned for a year, just banned. Yeah, if you flip your bottle within a year, they won't let you do the ballots anymore. Anyway, we're going on. I was meant to finish the episode five minutes ago. So, (laughs) the angels have had their shit. And you've had yours, whoever you are. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. Thanks Thanks for for coming. coming. (laughs) Whiskey and Things has been brought to you.